Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to the Metaka webinar, Architecture Alumni on the COVID-19 Frontlines. We thank the MIT Alumni Association and Moana Benton for her assistance in making this webinar possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived for viewing in the Metaka Infinite Connection website. Tonight, we will hear from our featured panelists, followed by a Q&A session. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature to write in your questions throughout the program and indicate which panelist you are addressing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pamela Tang, president of Metaka. Joining me tonight from the Metaka board are your moderators, Marilise Nepomechi and Kenneth Namcom. This is a forum for us to share the timely conversations around today's built environment through the lens of course for alumni. When COVID hit, MIT stepped up on all fronts to help our communities. Sharing these stories of innovation and grit reminds us that our alumni are well prepared to make a difference. Tonight, we hear from three distinguished course four graduates, Marcel Botha, Jeffrey Berman, and William Gilchrist, who put their education to work at vastly different scales, expertly fast tracking solutions to meet the COVID crisis. Mons et Manus translated to design and build. Let's start, shall we? Marilise and Ken. Hello everyone, thank you, Pam, um, and greetings to our speakers and to our attendees. All of you who are joining us from multiple time zones all the way around the world. Um, the MIT Architecture Alumni Association is honored to be speaking today, as Pam has just said, with an exceptional group of alumni who have leveraged their course for education in distinct ways and at unique scales as they've worked on the many complex challenges posed by COVID-19. We can jumpstart our conversation with an opening question. We'll ask each of you to please take around eight minutes to introduce yourselves and describe the ways in which you have found or created or perhaps been compelled to respond to opportunities that have arisen in the wake of our very fluid and very complicated present day reality. Um, if we could begin then with um, our colleague who's worked at the smallest scale, Marcel, the floor is yours. Well, thanks everyone. You can share your screen. Okay, Let's see, do you see me? Great. So, you know, I've been running 10X Beta in New York for 10 years. I graduated from the SMARCS program in 2006. I was uh, pursuing a dual degree in SMARCS and Media Lab. And I've been involved in IoT and medtech companies ever since um, I graduated. Um, we found the luxury of running a services company alongside a venture studio for many years. And um, that sort of in the, in the spirit of ingenuity and startup culture has been preserved over the years as we became more successful and almost been amplified as a result. On March 18th this year, which was a Wednesday, um, I received a call from a New Lab founder, um, Scott Cohen, that asked me to source an ICU ventilator. Um, and that ICU ventilator might sound uh, like a normal request with a new lab on a Wednesday night, but it's not a normal request right before the COVID first wave hit. Um, because we do a lot of medical product development, I reached out to five colleagues uh, on the East Coast and was able to source one from Philadelphia. That ventilator was then driven up from Philadelphia to New York and then to Boston the next day. And the Friday morning, I was on site in Boston uh, doing a pore science study with MIT uh, alum and uh, MIT uh, researchers at, um, in Lexington, looking um, at 
variant of a ventilator uh, that was based on the MIT EVENT project 10 years prior to figure out whether it would be a, a viable solution for the ventilator crisis that uh, was anticipated. That, that number was not clear on March or even March 20th. Uh, DARPA at that moment was uh, adamant that we needed to be ready to make up to 750,000 ventilators. Now, fast forward three months, we have learned enough about COVID today to know that we do, we can keep patients off ventilators with oxygen treatment and other methodologies. However, once you are uh, intubated, you uh, you know there's there's a sort of defined risk factor of whether you're going to su survive or not. The treatment is getting better, slowly but surely, uh, but you still have a very high risk of dying if you, uh, if you are on a ventilator and intubated. You have a zero chance of survival if you don't have access to a ventilator. Our goal, my goal and my mandate on um, March 20th was to go and see whether what MIT alumni and, um, and researchers were working on at that moment in time could be adapted for New York City, specifically for, uh, for uh, for, um, for the New York City stockpile. And we had basically 30 days to prove out and deliver 3,000 uh, ventilators that was um, authorized or uh, by the FDA under the emergency use authorization during this current crisis. Now, it, it was an impossible task. We um, had about 100 people working uh, at any given moment in time. What we did is we had three companies or three groups come together. Our group, 10X Beta, with a vast network of academic um, and professional uh, professionals uh, that uh, that could collaborate in real time, in person, in a factory in Long Island City. We have New Lab. Uh, New Lab is where our office is located in New York. New Lab is like a media lab style environment with about 135 companies all doing applied research and commercial commercial products and hardware. And then we had Boyce Technologies that was a, a vertically integrated R&D facility. So we set out immediately at the at Boyce location to start team building and figuring out how to take what was happening in Boston and how to rapidly commercialize that so that it could be scaled for 3,000, 10,000, 40,000 units. We put uh, supply chain experts on uh, evaluating what uh, the supply chain bottlenecks would be uh, worldwide. We, um, we used our networks to, um, to get to the global CEOs of Honeywell, to then get to the CEO for the US, um, to make sure we locked down the, uh, the pressure sensor supply chain for our product but not just for ourselves, but at any given moment in time when we envisioned that there was an opportunity to also solve a global shortage, we encouraged that supplier to make enough to, to solve global demand. So with Honeywell, we told them, I said, looking at the DARPA numbers, looking at what the US um, the JTAF army and the, uh, and the rest of the world were anticipating, um, they needed to make between 100,000 and 1 million centers available over the coming nine months. They did step up uh, to that challenge and started producing and accelerating production for those centers, which have a three-stage process of being manufactured both um, in the US and China and uh, back in the US for calibration. Um, that was one example. We, um, we ordered multiple variants of um, of parts that we may or may not use because of the, because we didn't have any supply chain guarantee at the moment of making the decision we were, uh, of what component we were going to use. So we, in many cases, we had to buy duplicate stuff and then deal with that afterwards. The photo on the screen shows how this consortium came together where we had R&D on the second floor of the building 
and we worked 20 hours a day for this for 30 days. We started on March 20th, and we got the EUA approval on April 17th, and we have not stopped since. We've, um, uh, we do not work 20 hours a day anymore, but the team has, uh, has normalized to 8 to 12 hour days since, um, since April 17th. We, um, the R&D facility looks over the manufacturing facility where the units are made on site. And the big thing that COVID taught us and the COVID response taught us was that we need to build a vertically integrated full supply chain and manufacturing on site, if not on site, in New York City. Because every state, every country, every group that was responding to this had the same challenges as us. We could not rely on past supply chain networks as we would normally do when we scale a product quickly. Um, fast forward, you know, there were a bunch of products that we worked on before COVID happened that's now being implemented in, uh, in a post-COVID or second wave response. Um, Inspiron is a company that is uh, using uh, non or contactless verification of interactions between patients and caregiving, caregivers and can do automatic uh, contact tracing at a very high fidelity rate in buildings, but also inside hospitals. Fuse is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the leading sensor products that's being used for proximity um, analysis and contact tracing inside buildings where G GPS and other technologies are not working well. And these are all things that we helped to develop over the past few years. Um, LPTV1 is a um, sort of a portable ambulance or wearable ambulance product that we initially did as a concept for, for, uh, for the fire department of New York that is now being rolled out as a potential mobile testing station. And then lastly, uh, one of our uh, sort of in-house venture products, Validose is, uh, is gearing up to be a, um, product for clinical trial validation of new drugs um, that roll out um, uh, as we learn more about the disease itself. But that's a quick overview of what we are working on right now. Thank you. Fantastic. Jeff, I wonder if you could join us then. Someone, someone has to start my video. So I'm Jeffrey, because the host has stopped my video. Start my video. Okay. Hi. So I'm Jeffrey Berman. I'm the principal of a 12 person architecture firm based in Manhattan. We specialize in the design of hospitals, healthcare facilities, research, scientific, clinical facilities and laboratories. We do some historic renovation and other technical architecture. I graduated from MIT undergraduate architecture program in 1980. I've worked in architecture and hospital design since then. And my firm was founded in 1988. So COVID project. <clears throat> in April, we were invited to join a team that was selected to build an emergency project in East Orange, New Jersey, at the East Orange General Hospital by the Army Corps of Engineers who were contracted by the New Jersey State Department of Health. The project was to convert an abandoned 1960s hospital building, which was currently being used as an office building, into a 250-bed non-acute COVID quarantine facility. This facility housed people who had tested positive for COVID, but did not require immediate medical attention, but by the same token could not go home and quarantine because they would affect, infect their families and they needed a place to be monitored until they recover. This was the model that was developed in, uh, in parts of Asia that seemed to work. The, facility controlled the spread of the virus. It offloaded patients from the hospitals that were contagious and couldn't circulate, but it also created space for the critically ill patients in the hospital where they could be supervised, monitored, and could be put on ventilators and oxygen. In New York City, they rented thousands of hospital rooms and thousands of hotel rooms 
that were empty and filled entire hotels with COVID quarantine patients. What was interesting about this project is the entire engagement from first phone call, assessing interests, trying to assemble the team, the substantial completion spanned a total of three weeks. The prime contractor who was an Army Corps requirements contract holder was called and said, we're gonna give you a contract to build some sort of COVID facility. We don't know where, we don't know what it's gonna be, but we're gonna call you in about a week and you're gonna have 14 days to design, approve, build, build this facility. So from that call, three days later, we were called and said, be in East Orange at seven o'clock on Tuesday morning. And from that date, we had 14 working day, 14 calendar days to obtain the approvals from the state and the local, local authorities having jurisdiction, complete the design and source all the materials and build this 250 bed facility, have it ready to turn over to the state for furniture, supplies, medical staff and patients to arrive. So the project started with everyone standing six feet apart with masks and gloves in the lobby of this building. And we, everyone introduced themselves, told this is what I do, this is what I'm here for. And we identified goals and we identified first steps that needed to be undertaken. We had to understand the program and how it would fit in the building. We had to identify resources that were available and materials and trades that were available to come in and do the work. Luckily, because construction in New York was shut down, there were plenty of people, plenty of tradesmen available. So that was not the problem. On average, we had 250 people working in the building every day on three shifts around the clock. So we got, we were a late start. So there were already several projects in process in the New York area. So that helped us and hurt us. It helped us in that there were some models that were being run by different hospitals and medical groups and, and other state health departments where initial decisions had been made and there were, there was a clear sort of clear path to, to to program and opening. We were able to use that as a model. We ultimately had to develop a unique model that met this building's capabilities and limitations and also fit in with the needs of this region in New Jersey and the capabilities of the University Hospital and East Orange Medical Center. So every, every day we look at what needed to be done, what we were prepared to do, what materials were available, what needed to be designed, drawn, and, and handed over to the trades to work on. And we, we were on this continuous approval process with the state health department in terms of understand, presenting what we were doing and obtaining approvals for the individual program elements and the final arrangement of the, of the facility. So like, like uh, Marcel, we, in, we very quickly ran into limitations on materials and supplies with a lot of the industry shut down, a lot of the suppliers closed certain things were hard to get. And then the fact that there were thousands of these beds in production around the region, a lot of the basic materials, a lot of the simple things that we thought would be sort of an, an easy fix, uh, plastic, plastic and metal panel systems and other things were not available. They were, you know, they were, everything that was within several hundred miles of here was, was bought and, 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 and assigned to another project. We ended up using simple, 
simple basic building materials and thinking of cre you know finding creative ways to arrange them in the building systems had to be diagnosed had to be tested and made functional and and so is as we worked through this piece by piece the project came together the approvals the approvals and the inspectors walked through and were were cooperative and you know basically understood that this had to be open in two weeks and so it was a question of finding that 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 middle ground between what the absolute code requirements were for hospitals and medical facilities and what was reasonable and safe to build. So what was interesting is the paradigm shift for, to extreme speed and uh, with limited flexibility in terms of the normal absolute restrictive codes we worked with presented some interesting challenges. The lockdown challenged my firm to find a new way to work together. So I ended up in the field, sketching, writing memos, calling people, and then the firm ran remotely, people designing, drawing, producing specifications, products, looking for materials in their areas of expertise. For the last three months, We've been working on these same issues with our clients and they're in the normal course of our business. The questions raised have to do with how do we change what we're doing now? Do we have a need to change what we're doing now? Are there new formulations for the permanent solutions we're building? Are there paradigms for working and delivering healthcare safely <coughs> that will support the current workflow and perhaps be more robust and more useful in a future unforeseen, you know, the next pandemic. In my 40 years, we've seen several of these pandemic events challenge the healthcare industry in New York, both. And each time there've been a different set of needs, a different schedule, a different set of resolutions where we and all our clients are beginning to think about how to develop a more resilient, flexible, robust way of thinking about some of the single purpose specialty designs we produce for specific medical functions. And we're looking to create more flexible, more responsive facilities able to meet some of these unforeseen and emergent needs that develop without notice can change and shift functions with limited construction interventions and have very, very low incremental first costs so that the improvements can be built into, into many projects and be perceived as a good value, even if they're used once over the course of the life of a facility. Thank you. All right, good afternoon and good evening. Bill Gilchrist checking in from the East Bay in Oakland, California, where I serve as the Director of Planning and Building for the city. And I wanted to just reflect a moment also on the uh, paths that have brought us to the various careers that we've chosen, much of which you're seeing showcased at the various scales of practice that each of us endeavor. And for me, um, like, my, like my, my colleague, my predecessor, I am a product of New York, of Harlem and Queens. And in that environment, uh, I really had the um, opportunity to be exposed to how cities are built, how architecture serves communities at various scales, and knew at that time that some pursuit in the built environment was going to be my calling. I also was blessed to be in a family that was at the forefront of civil rights movement at several locations across the nation, and certainly in New York City, where the idea was installed that in me that whatever profession one pursued, there was also a social obligation, a social contract to be fulfilled. So I was very, very happy when I arrived at MIT as an undergraduate, came out the class of 77 as an undergrad, 
that at that time, much of what um, we saw as a common theme and thread through the studios, through the courses in history, through the overall contextual instruction about what architecture, urban design and planning are, really dealt around its social construct. It wasn't just a phenomenon of how we build or how we achieve an aesthetic outcome, but really toward what purpose are we creating community? Are we building uh, facilities? Are we uh, inaugurating uh, landscapes? Uh, what is the purpose and need that these interventions have for community writ large? So I uh, continued at the Institute, um, as Pamela mentioned, uh, undergraduate and graduate, coming out with both the uh, MR degree and a uh, degree at Sloan School. And was gravi uh, gravity pulled me towards uh, engagement again at the urban scale of projects. I started off with a larger institutional portfolio and eventually took my first public service position in Birmingham, Alabama, and then went on to New Orleans, uh, focusing primarily post-Katrina on the uh, revitalization of that city. So in Oakland, California, uh, I've been here for two and a half years. Um, of all the ranges of professional intervention we have, being a director in planning or building in a situation like a COVID declaration compels one immediately to engage. We have our declarations of emergency. California was the first state in the union to actually enforce the shelter in place ordinance. And the nine counties in the Bay Area were the first counties in the state of California to enact the highest threshold of intervention around shelter in place and trying to contain the spread of the coronavirus. So what that meant essentially was that we had shut our cities down and under the direction of our counties uh, and San Francisco being the one in our area where both the county and the city are contiguous, we were compelled to restrict any sort of, of interaction, commerce, um, any kind of human interaction outside of what was declared as essential services. And that kind of definition obviously varies depending on the situation one finds oneself in, what is in fact essential. In the Bay Area, in much of California, but in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles in particular, we've been facing a housing crisis for many, many years. So it was clear that among the uh, projects that were going to move forward, while all others were shut down in contingents around the uh, spread of the coronavirus, we were gonna move forward with housing projects. And under iterations of declarations from our counties, Alameda being the county in which Oakland uh, is, is located, we were progressively restricting the amount of construction that could move forward, but we were allowing uh, housing to proceed. Then given some of the demographics and some of the um, uh, pathologies we're seeing with the, with the uh, disease, we restricted even further, the counties did, where the construction was only to be for affordable housing. So we had to, in our department in planning and building, working both as support to the emergency uh, operations center, I was on staff at the EOC, uh, and again, training over the years, particularly New Orleans had really prepared me to engage in an environment where we have this kind of, of duty, where we are, are um, again, compelled as public servants to bring our skill sets to address an emergency. In Oakland, given the nature of the COVID, what this really meant was that we had to uh, engage in very tight coordination across all the departments to make sure that the ordinances and the orders in the county were being enforced, but also to use our built environments, both outside and inside, to provide for contingent locations around um, triage, around um, assisting for shelter, again, driven very much by shelter needs and housing needs in our communities and also to work cooperatively across other jurisdictions in the county writ large in terms of standing up centers for testing, uh, centers, uh, again, for housing, uh, to, to provide uh, contingent shelter for the homeless, and engage in very rapid um, measure across the weeks of declaration to accommodate some of the most disenfranchised community. Then the other um, opportunities that aligned as the uh, shelter in place orders were being updated and revisited and moving towards some relaxation was to look at how we would design around our infrastructure. Uh, we were one of the first cities in the nation to look at a uh, slow streets program. And uh, we're very fortunate in Oakland to have a mayor who believes very affirmatively in the purpose and need of urban design and planning. And it was really at her initiative and her creative thinking that we looked at how we could purposefully use the streets that now had minimum traffic, if any, on them to provide greater public space for social distancing so that we were able to um, allow uh, community to go outside, to uh, recreate, to get out of their shelters as the county orders allowed, 
and we gave them space and venue in the urban fabric where they could in fact engage. And then uh, uh, subsequently with um, more relaxation around the orders, we have been looking at allowing uh, restaurants and retail establishments with primarily restaurants to use the public domain, to, to go into streets, to go into parking lots in a way that allows uh, their patronage, allows um, customers to be able to come and safely use those environments. Uh, and also be thoughtful of the urban design consequences. What's the character and nature of the, tree, of the street, of its transect, um, of its, of its um, use and the, the range of uses that a street still has to provide as it also has taken on almost this ubiquitously Parisian cafe feel as more and more um, restaurants uh, and groceries and other providers are making beneficial use of the right of way in order to be compliant with the health parameters that are now in place around addressing the COVID. So all of this is going around, on around our health um, parameters and addressing this, this unprecedented impact uh, to our country, our region and our cities. And then we have running parallel, an amazing, an amazing eruption again of an ongoing social conversation that has been in place in this continent since 1619. And on June 19th, as a culmination of much of what happened uh, across the country in terms of the impacts of people of, on people of color through the uh, law enforcement of Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, we found ourselves again engaged with much of urban America in the revitalization of the social protest, something we had not seen like, in, uh, since the late 60s, in terms of people again asserting basic rights they had to be a part of their cities to be within their community. And this image that's coming online now is a picture from my office on June 19th, which for all of its historic celebration, given the Emancipation Proclamation news finally reaching Texas, it took on an added gravity given an importance for the communities to be able to demonstrate their commitment to be able to enjoy their franchise of full citizenship in this nation, irrespective of color, to be safe, to be able to pursue all opportunities and continue an ongoing struggle that all of our pre previous generations have been engaged in also to get us where we are today. So Oakland, given its particular culture of, active, of activism and advocacy, its history of contribution to civil rights movement across the nation certainly was going to be one of the main fulcrums, one of the main uh, uh, points of vortexes really of this conversation. And how we think about our public spaces, even in light of, of the COVID at one extreme, calling for their um, uh, vacancy. And when the, the need for social protest has always activated them around another program and all the range of uses in between, as designers, we have to think about the public spaces we're creating. And again, I think back to the MIT education that we have enjoyed and how wonderfully it has prepared us across the sections of discipline and um, interdisciplinary engagement of how we look at engineering, how we look at sociology, how we look at microclimates, how we look at ecology, we look at economics, and understand that architecture, urban design and planning, landscape architecture, are not separate disciplines to be siloed around their own outcome, but they have to inform each other, they have to be informed by each other, and by the full range of disciplines that affect our human condition, including epidemiology and health. And for all of us who know how cities have been formed, uh, the, the, the history of plague, of cholera, of all of these events, have shaped the form of our infrastructure from our closed sewer systems to the need for great parks and open spaces for, recre to, for recreation, particularly given um, the densities that cities have taken over the last uh, century plus. So the education that we've received at the Institute, the um, range of preparation that it's given us to be able to encounter these unforeseen circumstances and demand on those skills, certainly has been a, a remarkable legacy that the school has left us to move forward with. And um, I, I certainly feel that for the work that I've been called on to do, uh, whether it was work with New Orleans post Katrina in helping to reconstitute that city with its great communities, or where we find ourselves now in Oakland among a family of cities across the globe, struggling to see how we move forward, how we rebuild what our future will be. Uh, MIT has made a great investment in all of us to be able to take this charge and to acquit ourselves well through it. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready to move to um, the first uh, moderator questions. There's only two of them. So um, I think, uh, uh, Marilise. Why don't you start? 
Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to sort of uh, 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 take 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 over the airspace there. I just. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, we wanted to ask, um, basically, um, how has the nature of your work changed as a result of the global uh, pandemic? Do you see um, also, you know, in, in the context of everything else that's going on, do you see additional changes um, to your work methods or your processes um, as a result of sort of um, recent um, uh, the, the, the Black Lives Matter and, and the so other social protests that are currently happening um, around the world? And we'll start again, sorry, uh, Mar uh, Marcel, Jeff, and uh, Bill. So, so on the COVID side, you know, I, um, I, for a while I lacked the empathy to understand what it was to work from home because I did not work from home at all during the COVID crisis so far. I, I worked the hardest I've probably worked ever in my life uh, with the exception of maybe some MIT deadlines during grad school. And um, we, we were forced very quickly to ramp up our thinking around um, social distancing inside the office, um, safety protocols, uh, thermal checks and uh, other safety checks at entry of the building since March. So all the things that are now being applied to how do we bring people safely back to work, we prototyped and implemented immediately. For those of my, on my team that worked from home, they, um, there was very little, you know, we preemptively told the team that, look at what Europe is doing. You are likely going to work from home. So early in March, before any of the cities decided what their protocol was, our company decided that you, we all needed to be ready to work from home. So I implored everyone to go mobile. Everyone needed to be ready. Everyone needed to, needed to take equipment from the office home. And, that, and we didn't know that we were going to work on the ventilator project until after we implemented that. In April, um, in April and May, as the focus shift, shifted towards the social protests. And one of the big things that came uh, to mind uh, for me, and we, we were still in the thick of delivering machines worldwide, having conversations with other regions that needed them. So um, one of the biggest challenges for us as an engineering heavy group is, uh, you know, is the equitable, um, you know, access that minority groups have to work, to work with companies like ours. Because if we look at when we, when we put out, um, when we put out a job advert to work at 10X Beta or companies inside New Lab, we get hundreds of applicants per position. But these are disproportionate uh, to, be, uh, to, to people who are, uh, who are mostly formerly advantaged individuals and coming from South Africa, I was really thinking over the last month, like how do I, you know, how, how do we turn that on its head where we are actually engaging with the community at all ages, all scales, so that we can, you know, throw our weight behind STEM education in uh, both locally and regionally to get better talent or to foster better talent from uh, minority groups who won't have that access otherwise. And so, so it's, it's not something that's new to our group. We, we, we have tried various systems, but I, I think one of the realizations for me was that we need to double down. We can't just think about it. We have to actually invest money in getting, um, so the, to create, to creating opportunities of access. To, uh, I think that's the right approach. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? Bill wants to. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go ahead and let Jeffrey hit it if you had anything in mind, because I, I definitely do. This is much of the arena <laughs> work we're in. OK. Well, um, yeah, absolutely. From a city planning perspective, uh, the COVID impact and, again, the um, congealing around the conversation for social uh, and racial justice is going to have significant impact on our work. When you just do, by the numbers in the COVID, uh, the, the disruption that is caused around the normal routine of life uh, and what that means in terms of spaces and buildings. You mentioned working from home. I think there's a big question in terms of office operations, how many of these floor plates traditionally that have been built for offices are going to be occupied again? To what extent is remote working going to stick as part of the working model for, um, for uh, business, uh, particularly for um, commercial uh, business um, and uh, office operations institutions? 
that may not actually have to have people in place in order to transact. So we have big questions even around our zoning, around our land use regulations, what will we be looking at moving forward in terms of what the new DNA looks like for urban form and space, the way it's going to be used. We're in the process of wrapping up for downtown open a uh, master plan that's been uh, gestating for about four years, four or five years. Well, so many of the economic assumptions we had just six months ago have to be reconsidered. And I think what it's going to do is compel us in the planning arena uh, on the planning side in arc of architecture and urban design to come up with models that rather than thinking about a five-year plan, we have to think about plans that may capture a moment in depth, but then have to be um, tractable, fungible. We have to, in real time, be able to test assumptions. So where we might not have tested assumptions on our upcoming downtown plan for another year or two years, given the impact of COVID being the demand on, on race uh, and equity and justice in the planning, we're probably gonna need to be looking at this on a much more frequent basis. Let's say a six month week, maybe even more frequently than that. And then what do we constitute as tools that allow our plans to adapt and respond to these realities that we find? So um, if anything, it seems that the, uh, both the rate of occurrence of these events and what they have exposed in terms of how healthy our communities are, how well do we design them to deal with these kind of pandemics or epidemics. And then this ongoing question of race and equity, which was forefront well before COVID hit. I mean, much of our uh, uh, investigation around our planning, we have a wonderful office of race and equity headed by a brilliant colleague who does the analytics, who looks at the numbers, the correlations, the statistics. We knew we had much to address through our planning around our race and equity uh, coming out the gate. What has happened, what has been placed in evidence in addition to the impact of COVID has put that much more in the forefront again of the work we do. So I think this is going to be a game changer in many ways about how we think about space moving forward. And again, even from an urban design sense, open space parks, how do we design them in a way that they work for the small crowd that may have to be socially distanced or for a larger assembly as we saw a moment ago at Frank Ogawa pa uh, Park and Plaza in uh, Oakland that we presented on the slide. So there's a lot of thinking and information that we're gonna need to take out of this in terms of how we do our work. So, Jeff, go ahead, you're on mute. Jeff, you're mute. <laughs> okay, early on. <laughs> My issues related mostly to to my small my staff, I, everyone, you know, immediate health concerns. Coming to work, getting on the subway, what's going on? Do I have to come in every day? This this is you know, so we dealt with those very you know we dealt with those quickly and the started to virtualize the office, and and put people you know put resources in people's homes to to move them out you know, in, in, in late February and early March. By the time things closed down, everyone had, had, you know, tested out a day or two at home, but then being thrown into this, into this crisis, crisis project in the middle of April was fascinating because there was no real science or medicine or guidance to as to how to move forward into what, what a reasonable and safe working method would be, how to manage, you know, 200, 250 people in a building using three elevators to go up and down between seven floors on a, on a 24 hour basis was, was an interesting and, and puzzling, you know, it was, it was an interesting puzzle to figure out what, what PPE was available you know, when I had left, when I closed my office, I stopped down at the hardware store my last day in the office and I bought the last bottle of Purell and the last, the last box of Clorox wipes in the store. And those lasted me through, you know, through the end of April in the car, every, you know, it's the, every time you touch something, every time you moved, it's, you know, it's clean, clean. And we were, you know, we were successful because in the, in the three weeks, no one, no one got, no one got sick, no one got hurt and the project got done. So it was an, it, it was, it, it was a fascinating thing to compress your normal 
your normal life into a few days. Thank you. We actually have a couple of questions in the queue, and one of them is particularly relevant to the discussion that you all have started right now. Uh, we have one questioner who wrote um, saying that uh, during the pandemic, many people have worked remotely. Many of them have raised the question as to why live in the city at all. Um, is there an urban penalty, in other words, um, as a result of the pandemic experience. In addition, many firms are thinking that renting office space in the future might not be necessary. And this is one of the things that Bill just brought up. So the question is, how might the COVID-19 pandemic, one, change architecture and urban design in the longer term? Number two, is this a crisis for the profession as you see it? Um, it was asked broadly. So any one of you who is interested, if you would please jump in. I think any, yeah. any crisis, major change is an opportunity for the design professions to step up and think clearly in a, in a progressive and forward moving way about what, what can be gained from this rather than looking back at what, what we've lost and what's been taken from us in this period and by this series of events. There, you know, there's this is much bigger social, this is a much bigger social and, 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 and personal impact than in a lot of the financial and other crises we've seen in the, in the country over the years. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and it, it is an opportunity. What happens is that we, we're gonna end up needing to think more regionally about how we design. It's not just about cities within a political boundary but it's thinking more regionally in terms of the whole chain and network of how settlements uh, create, you know, their construct of, of, within an area, within a region. Um, when you think about de-densifying, it may mean that we take a different tack in terms of, you know, singular high rise of very tall buildings, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a uh, an non-urban culture. You think of, of cities like Washington, D.C. or Paris, remarkable densities, but very, very restricted in terms of their heights, at least for the most, you know, part of their footprint or geography. And then you think of all those wonderful um, uh, cities and, and villages and towns over history that we studied with, with, with David Friedman and Hank Millen and, and Stan Anderson, uh, just looking at, at how cities developed across the centuries. Um, they've taken all kinds of form. They reacted to all kinds of situations similar to what we have now. And it hasn't meant the end of the design profession. It's given, as Jeffrey said, a whole new infusion of how we need to think about our space. And think about other consequences that may be beneficial if we go to a, um, uh, a more uh, proximate relationship of work and, and, and um, home. Uh, again, sort of a multinucleated uh, uh, a region where you may have many tighter clusters, almost a village type development within a footprint as opposed to uh, hour, two hour, three hour commutes, you know, from one's residence to, um, to a downtown or in town location. It does mean a lot of change in attitude uh, because given the public processes that create, the regulations that then create these designs, people are going to have to rethink about how they want to live. But um, I think, again, Jeffrey made the point earlier that on um, a use of mass transit, you know, how long is it going to be before folks really feel comfortable on long commutes of the subway or the Long Island Railroad or, you know, any kind of regional transit system or transportation system wow. and may decide that they don't have such a problem with this new development happening a few blocks from their home in what we now call the burbs and really creates more of an urban fabric there. So I, I think it definitely is going to call the question about changes, and a lot of them are going to be economically driven uh, around the the cost. But um, I think it's a great opportunity. We should we should seize it. Yeah, I fully agree. I think um, you know my family and my office we've all discussed: Do we need to be in New York City? And the the resounding answer is always yes, because that's where our R and D and our manufacturing operation operations are centralized. We are, however, looking at how, what is the future of our work around healthcare innovation, um, transportation innovation, as well as of urban ecology, and how those things inter um, mediate a future city where we want to live, and what are all the opportunities, and what are all the things already happening naturally, like sidewalk, di sidewalk dining, and, you know, maybe uh, hopefully some planning um, 
uh, easing around to live workspaces where you control and have access to the same space in one building, like you know what what every architect dreams of. And I think that we are um, we're doubling down, staying in the city, and making i'm sorry i think marcel is breaking up um just wanted to provide a uh, reminder that we have 10 minutes left to the webinar and uh, if uh, our panelists could uh, provide their closing remarks thank you i'm going to defer to jeffrey first thank you so I'm a New York, I'm a Manhattan person. I raised both my kids in Manhattan and I live there. I've retreated to the lake for peace of mind and quiet. And, and I'm, I'm puzzled by where, where I end up and how this plays out. I know the office has been this enduring concept and icon and it's been a foundation of work and design and, 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 and the US economy. And in, in many ways, I miss, I miss being in the office every day. I miss the interaction and, and the, 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 the interplay and, and the discussion. And I think if it's either gonna come roaring back as soon as as soon as things settle out and we know we've dealt with the medical issues or we're gonna to have to find and develop a better paradigm than the Zoom, than the Zoom grid and the, the, these you know, sort of marginal video conferences. Uh, I, know, I know my staff and I have been, have been playing with new concepts and ideas and, and, you know, I don't have an answer. So, but I'm looking for one. Hope, I hope we can all find, find that going forward. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, again, I, I think just pulling the theme together of this event, I, I want to acknowledge um, the Institute and the way I think it prepared us as design professionals to be able both to engage the various scales that are represented in this group in this panel but also to think, uh, to Jeffrey's point, about how we deal with the unknown and what's uncertain, that it's not been a solutionist kind of education. It's really been one that tries to look at the context of what factors are in play and how do we create um, environments that sustain and that enrich and that uh, complement the, 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 the venues uh, where, where uh, we find them, where we create them. Um, I, I think, again, of the whole social contract, con, uh, contract idea around design, um, you know, learning at the smaller scale from a, a Chet Sprague or a Jan Wampler or a Morris Smith, uh, thinking about the urban scale from an Imre Halash or a David Lee or a Tunney Lee or a Jack Meyer. Um, what I understood, I mentioned before about history, about how uh, cities and, and, and architecture are formed by so many factors. Uh, at Hank Millen and David Friedman and Stan Anderson made sure we understood coming through their courses and how well they've prepared us. Uh, I'll never forget, Shun Kondo once told me right before graduation, that he felt the best value of our MIT education was not what we were going to land on our first job, but when we had a real responsibility or accountability for making places and creating places that we will have been um, schooled with the kind of um, projective analytical and, and um, rational sensibilities about looking at places, understanding needs and addressing those. And that was the, the true value of the education. So again, I think there's a lot that we're gonna be facing. None of us knows what even the six, next six months are going to look like. But um, I'm very glad to be in the company of some very good people who have been very well equipped in order to take this on. And again, I thank the MIT Architectural Alumni for convening this panel. And I'm sure there'll be many more as we continue to try to figure this all out. Thanks. Yes, just as a closing remark, thanks everyone. Um, it's been wonderful to participate. I think that, um, you know, I think one of the questions that remains unanswered, I can also answer this in my closing remar remark, MIT is doing a fantastic job already to make sure that the connections between the Institute and its alumni remain strong. I have been lucky to, uh, it feels like I was there yesterday, even after 15 years. And um, 
many of my recent pro uh, product successes, specifically the ventilator response, is because of the strong connection with the MIT community, MIT alumni, and that hive mind that exists when you need it. It's uh, we don't have time to hang out socially that often, but when you need it and you need to double down and you need the best people in the room, they show up and they show up consistently. And I think uh, where we are, you know, one one of the beautiful things that's happened from this crisis, and you know, and it's just one crisis, and there's many more that we're going to have to deal with as a group together, is that very few of us are traveling, if at all. And we're still doing our jobs very effectively. I think that um, the, the long-term sustainable imp or sustainability impact of the new choices of workflow, how we work, how we design, how we review, how we share together, these are areas where we're going to start investing more heavily. I think creating opportunities for the MIT architecture uh, and planning students to, uh, you know, at least on in our group to come and see the 135 companies that work in urban tech and technology applications that overlay over the urban fabric and see you know, what opportunities exist beyond uh, sort of their known or assumed construct of what a future career is. And I think it's a really exciting time about what the next 20 years will hold uh, on the East Coast um, and West Coast and everywhere in between. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I actually think, I don't know, Pam, do we have time for one more question from our q and <laughs> I know you've all had wonderful closing statements and perhaps we don't. No, she's back. I think we don't. <laughs> oh, yes, you do, you do. You do. Okay. One last question. So we had one last question that actually picks up on the, um, the things that You've all just said, um, and the question is this, Bill Gilchrist's moving and powerful commentary leads me to wonder if you might each speak to the ways or directions in which you'd like to see MIT pivot or amplify to better meet and train our students to help meet the challenges of the new world that we're looking at today. In other words, how can MIT position our students to meet the challenges of the world more effectively? If I may, I'll, I'm going to jump in. I, I yes, think please. one of the greatest assets the Institute has is that the architecture school is outstanding center of excellence among many centers of excellence. You have transportation, engineering of all disciplines, computer science, you have right there the, the forefront of thinking around technology in response to people's needs. The more that we can integrate that into how we do our studios and think about our studios in terms of resources and design, I think the more prepared we'll be for whatever may be coming down the road, both in terms of our own mastery as designers, but also knowing how to have conversations with other experts of disciplines that we may need to incorporate in our thinking. MIT is uniquely positioned that way. And it also has a culture of interdisciplinary engagement. You know, just look at anything that it's come out with. It's normally the result of two different luminaires from different departments talking over a water cooler, having a cup of coffee. But just that, that level of interaction that the Institute can provide that's what I'd love to see the School of Architecture and Planning take greater advantage of. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Other, any other thoughts? Jeffrey, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll figure this out eventually. It's only and, three months. And we have exactly two minutes left. <laughs> uh, my time at MIT, I, I remember the architecture school as being siloed. And, very, very much from the rest of the institution, maybe a little outreach to civil engineering or, or one, one of the other disciplines that have building trades involved. I'm encouraged to see the, to see the school reach out and embrace the rest of the institute and, and, and bring, the students, bring the students in and think about the architecture school as the home of, of design at MIT. All engineering is a, are design disciplines but architecture has this unique, unique place about designing, for, about designing for people and space and, 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 and life. And I think that's critical to integrate in everything we, everything we make and everything we do on this planet. As a, as a final comment, I would just say, uh, lean on your alumni. I think we have an obligation to help you 
um, educate those current students uh, through future placements, internships, and opportunities there, or lectures uh, to figure out how we can advise and guide them in, in their future careers. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists and our moderators, and thank you to our audience especially. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.